Aloha, everyone, and welcome to Hawaii Together on ThinkTech Hawaii. I'm Kaylee Akina, your host and president of the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. You know, it's become common practice here in Hawaii to blame scapegoats for the state's disastrous housing crisis, the lack of housing and the high prices. And whether these scapegoats are foreign or mainland buyers, short-term vacation homeowners, or so-called owners of empty homes, the research doesn't necessarily support the accusation. Now, of course, the real cause is simply too many barriers in the way of new home building, as virtually all in-depth studies have shown that that's really the problem behind our scarcity of housing and its high cost. Nevertheless, mistaken notions about how to solve Hawaii's housing crisis persist. And on this show, we're going to take a look at that issue with respect to vacant homes. Just last week, uh, my team at the Grassroot Institute released a new report titled The Empty Homes Theory of Hawaii Housing Crisis. And that's the topic of today's show. Well, today I'm pleased to be joined by Jensen Ahakovi, who is a research associate at the Grassroot Institute. He's done some great work so far. He also wrote the Institute's groundbreaking report about the outsider, outsider theory of Hawaii housing, which we uh, issued last year. But recently, he has been the chief author of a report that we've released talking about the situation of vacant homes in Hawaii. Welcome to the program, Jensen. Thanks for having me. Good to be back. Well, you're doing great work, and I want to jump right into the topic today. You know, as, as I'm sure almost everyone in Hawaii knows, our islands have some of the highest home prices in the nation, if not the highest. And uh, many proposals have been put forth at the state and county level uh, to address this. Now, one of the proposals that has been put forth is to impose a tax on so-called empty homes. Before we dive into analyzing that, let's get our definitions right. What exactly do we mean by an empty home? And uh, why in the world are people thinking of taxing them? Yeah, so an empty home, you know, you would think the definition is, is pretty intuitive. Uh, it should be in the name. Uh, but it turns out that the definition is, is quite ambiguous. Um, so, for example, in France, uh, a vacant unit is legally defined as uh, one that is unoccupied for at least a year. Uh, in Oakland, California, any unit that is used uh, less than 50 days out of the year is considered vacant. Uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, a vacant unit is one that is unoccupied for 30 days or more. Uh, and in Honolulu's Bill 9, which has been uh, been talked about recently, and in uh, Vancouver, Canada's current vacancy tax that they have, um, they define vacancies as any unit unoccupied for more than six months. Um, now, as to why people think they need to be taxed, uh, well, some people think that vacancies are a signal of an inefficient housing market, um, that if there is a lot of underutilized housing uh, in a market, that uh, that means that the market is unhealthy and that they need to encourage people to uh, lease out or rent those units uh, out to, to tenants to resolve things like housing shortages and high prices. Well, Jensen, you co-wrote the grassroot report with Mark Coleman, our editor in chief. And in it, uh, there are at least three or four specific reasons that, that are offered as to why people are calling for attacks on empty homes. You want to go through those a little bit to explain the rationale that supporters are giving? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so you're correct. There are about you know three or four goals that some people outlined. Uh, some of them uh, include increasing the housing supply, uh, which is similar to also wanting to reduce vacancies. Um, and the logic behind that is that a vacancy tax will encourage vacant property owners to sell or rent their properties to tenants. Uh, another goal would be to increase affordability. And this might be achieved, for instance, if the vacancy tax does end up increasing occupancies. And the other obvious goal is really just to raise revenue. Um, it is a tax after all, and people have to pay the tax if they have a vacant property. So there will be uh, some money earned uh, by the local government. Well, Jensen, let's try to get a little bit of perspective on this. 
exactly how many vacant homes are we talking about here in the state of Hawaii? Yeah, so in 2020, Hawaii's vacancy rate was about 14.4%, um, which is the ratio of vacant units to the total housing stock in the state. And that translates to about 78,000 vacant units. Uh, now, that does sound like a lot. 78,000 is a non-trivial number. Uh, but if we look across the country, you might expect for Hawaii to be near the top in terms of vacancies, at least given the rhetoric that some people have 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 said about the issue. Um, but if you look at the data, it turns out that Hawaii is actually just about in the middle um, of the nation in terms in terms of vacancy rates. So it's it's not like we're some crazy outlier um, in terms of in terms of empty homes. Well, let's go to some broad strokes right now. What are some of the major findings of the research that you and Mark have just completed? Uh, specifically, uh, would an empty or vacant home tax be successful? Would it produce the kind of results that people really want to see? Yeah. So first, what we do in the report is we wanted to understand what the nature of the relationship uh, is between vacancies and housing prices uh, in Hawaii. So we looked at neighborhood level data from the U.S. Census Bureau's American Community Survey uh, between the years 2010 to 2019. Uh, what this does is it allows us to apply some, some uh, uh, pretty useful statistical techniques to measure how the number of vacancies has changed over time in relation to housing prices in Hawaii. And we found that vacancies appear to be largely uncorrelated with local housing prices. And this is even after accounting for the fact uh, that neighborhoods have differences in socioeconomic status uh, and geography. And so that finding alone suggests that a vacancy tax wouldn't really do much to increase uh, affordability. Uh, but again, uh, we also look at the various goals of a vacancy tax, because after all, uh, the success of the tax uh, really pretty much depends on what the framework of success that the lawmakers have. Uh, lawmakers will surely earn some revenue from the tax. So that goes towards the idea that a tax that the tax will raise revenue. But if they want to increase affordability, like I just said, that likely won't happen to any meaningful degree. Uh, if they want to reduce vacancies, that actually might happen. But remember, a reduction in vacancies doesn't actually mean that there is an increase in the housing supply. And that's simply because the housing supply or the, the total number of units in Hawaii would remain the same. Uh, what changes is that the tax merely shifts the utilization of existing units into uh, occupied units. And that's an important nuance because Hawaii's housing crisis is, is not caused by the underutilization uh, of the existing housing stock, but rather because uh, there is insufficient production of new housing. Well, that's an important point to recognize that it, we're really dealing with the supply of housing and the solution has to do with increasing that supply, as we have said many times. Now, in your research, what about some of the cities that already have an empty homes tax um, in the United States or even elsewhere? Tell me a little bit about that. How, how many are there out there? Has the tax worked for them? And again, I suppose that would be depending upon the specific goals, as you point out, that they have. Yeah, so it turns out there aren't too many. Um, so in the U.S., there are really only a few cities that have them. I mentioned Washington, D.C. earlier, um, Oakland, California, and most recently, uh, San Francisco and Berkeley, also um, cities in, in California. Uh, internationally, uh, Vancouver in Canada is, is well known for its vacancy tax, as I also mentioned previously. Um, in Europe, Vancouver, or sorry, in Europe, France uh, has its own vacancy tax. Uh, however, France is slightly different. Uh, from the ones that I just mentioned, because theirs is one that uh, was implemented by the national government, whereas in the U.S., local jurisdictions typically uh, implement these sorts of policies. 
Well, in places where there are vacancy taxes, how do they get enforced? Uh, I imagine that once a tax is levied, uh, the the municipality or the authority uh, enforcing it is has to uh, take measures such as hiring new personnel, opening new offices, uh, establishing penalties and fines, and maybe <laughs> even establishing a police force. I mean, how, how does this all look? What 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 goes into the enforcement process and uh, how effective is it? Yeah, so in most cases, enforcement is dependent upon property owners uh, registering their vacant properties with the local government. Um, other enforcement mechanisms come in the form of auditing and inspection, uh, where government officials um, actually try to check utility usage, uh, such as water and electric, to determine whether a property is occupied or not. Um, governments have also implemented whistleblower hotlines uh, that uh, let people effectively tattletale uh, on, on others who, who haven't registered uh, their vacant properties. Uh, now, the, the issue of enforcement is important because, um, as many people have pointed out before uh, when researching vacancy taxes, um, sometimes the enforcement of the policy can often exceed uh, the benefits of the policy. So, as you mentioned, you know, that might require hiring additional administrative staff to administer the tax and to keep track of people um, who are compliant and uh, non-compliant with the tax. Uh, so, you know, yeah, those are some of the things that that uh, contribute to efficient enforcement. As of right now, uh, as I said, there aren't too many examples of vacancy taxes out there. So the literature is unfortunately fairly, fairly scarce as to whether these taxes are enforced efficiently and effectively. Well, beyond uh, potential nightmares in terms of enforcement, what could some of the side effects be of an, in, trying to enact taxation on empty homes? Um, there, there must be some people who, for good reason, as local residents as well, uh, have their homes empty for whatever purpose it, there, may, may, there, there may be, and they could get caught up in some real legal issues. Uh, in this, what kinds of negative side effects could we see? Yeah, so, you know, probably one of the biggest sources of contention with this idea of a vacancy tax is that there are definitely some legal and constitutional implications um, with the idea that uh, the local government uh, can mandate the usage of a property or can essentially uh, force you to utilize your property in some sort of way. Uh, now, I'm not a legal scholar. Uh, I, my area is economics, but that is a that is definitely a a, a glaring problem that has been debated a, a lot about uh, in in the vacancy tax literature. Another issue with the vacancy tax is that uh, there might be some incentive there for the property owners of existing vacant property to pass the burden of the tax on to tenants that they may. Uh, that they may already be landlords for. Uh, so, for example, if a property owner uh, has a few vacant properties, but also uh, rents the the property out, rents some of his property out to other people, he might be taxed on some of that property and then pass off the burden of the tax by increasing rents uh, for other tenants. That's also uh, quite a large problem associated with the vacancy tax because. If people want to increase affordability, they might actually inadvertently decrease affordability with the tax. Now, when we decide to go after research at the Grassroot Institute, it's not because we're sitting around in the office trying to think of things to research. There's definitely a, a context. And, and there was a real context to the first report in your series that took a look at urban myths, so to speak, or things that people believe about the causes of the housing shortage and the housing costs, but are not necessarily founded on research or fact. And the first report had to do with the myth of the outside buyer. Do you want to summarize that just a little bit and, and tell our viewers what we learned and how we learned it? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, for those who may not be familiar, I, I, authored, I, I did author our, our recent report on the influence of out-of-state buyers uh, in relation to to housing prices here in Hawaii, and basically what we found uh, is that 
the prevalence of out-of-state buyers has been decreasing um, over the past decade. So it's really hard to make the case that out-of-state buyers have driven up uh, local housing prices if, in fact, we've seen fewer of them um, of over the years. It's, it's very hard to make, to make that association. Um, instead, we make the case that out-of-state buyers really are, like you've said, Dr. Akina, uh, a scapegoat. Uh, it's a very politically attractive uh, notion to, to sell to the public that outsiders are the cause of, of a very internal issue, such as the state's very burdensome housing regulations. Well, it's very interesting to note that many public figures and other individuals, no, including some good. in the media, simply don't look at the numbers. They're, they're, they don't seem to be terribly concerned about the kind of research methodology that, that we use and instead continue to use various anecdotal methodologies. Let, let me give you an example. Um, I, I heard recently in a public setting, a public official say that most of the buyers of the homes in the Kaka'ako area must be from the mainland uh, because when he drives by at night, he sees the lights out. And uh, for that reason, he must be viewing empty homes purchased by mainlanders. Now, as a supposition, that's fine. But when public policy is based upon such ideas, we end up with certain consequences in the policy world that we really don't want to have. What are your thoughts about this? Yeah, so I think I think that idea boils down to the basic political economy of the issue. Like I like I mentioned before, that there's an incentive uh, for lawmakers to use things like you've said, like anecdotal stories of the 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 darkened apartment buildings in Kaka'ako um, as evidence to suggest that this is an issue that is widespread uh, throughout the state. Um, and I think the incentive works out in such a way that, as I mentioned before, it's it's very politically attractive to pass off the blame to some external mechanism when the problem really is an internal mechanism. Um, the same goes, for example, when it comes to uh, city council hearings on uh, proposed developments uh, in in in, resi in residential neighborhoods. Um, so, for example, there's a lot of good research out there that finds that uh, people who currently live in a community have a disproportionate impact in the decision making of local councilors when deciding to approve or reject a housing project uh, in that community. Um, and it's a very similar function uh, to how legislatures act when they talk about outside buyers or, say, empty homes. It's that it just get it gets a lot of votes. It's very attractive, but once again, uh, what gets a lot of votes isn't always the most effective policy, especially when it comes to the housing crisis here. In both of the recent reports you've worked on, uh, you have used very strict methodology that has been applied nationwide, looking at all the available data we possibly could look at. What kind of feedback have you gotten from uh, professionals who actually understand this kind of research? For example, some of the economists who've looked at our work. Yeah, um, you know, there was, a, I, I will say that this was my first uh, foray uh, into the, the world of research and public policy, uh, because, you know, I don't think I was ready to, to bear the brunt of the impact from, say, the general public. Uh, you know, uh, and and contrast that to the the response from say academia and the professional world. Uh, so when we look at the response from like the professional world, from economists and other ex experts in 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 housing, it was it was a generally very positive exchange. Um, even though some people uh, were still uh, skeptical of the idea that outsiders had had very little impact over prices. Uh, it was still very good to get the feedback from those experts because I, for one, admired a lot of them. For example, in the outside buyer report, 
uh, I was able to get comments from Joseph Giarco, uh, who's an economist at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, who developed the Wharton uh, Land Use Index that measures the restrictiveness of regulations um, across across the U.S. and the housing market. Uh, I got to talk to you know Paul Brubaker, for instance, who uh, who's a very smart man. Now, when we juxtapose that with the reaction from the general public, it was very much uh, 50-50. Uh, so I, I actually distinctly remember uh, that uh, somebody uh, made a TikTok about me and uh, made a TikTok about the Grassroot Institute, talking about how we were um, funded by developers and that, uh, that we had all this uh, dark money funding this disinformation. Uh, but, uh, you know, to, to tell those people who may be listening, uh, that was not the case. Uh, I can I I did not receive any additional funding besides my regular paycheck uh, for uh, for this research. Um, and so. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think, you know, the 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 reception was mixed uh, and I, I think it's too early to tell um, what the reception might look like for this empty homes report. Uh, but uh, I, I hope that uh, I hope that I can see somewhat of a of a slightly better experience uh, from from the first time. Well, much of the response by some of the public who are critical is not well informed in terms of understanding the research methodology, and actually, in many cases, having read the report, uh, which is well documented, um, I, I think that. Uh, when we take pains to do this kind of work, uh, it it requires a certain kind of audience to to appreciate it. But keep it up. Uh, you, you're doing great work, and we know that the professionals and the peers who review our work uh, are giving us good feedback that it's on solid ground. Now, let's shift gear just a little bit and, and talk about uh, some alternative here. If a vacancy tax won't help lower prices, or increase the housing supply, what what would we recommend instead? Um, in the report, we talk about barriers to home building, such as land use, zoning, other government regulations. Uh, we've certainly cataloged the, the kinds of things that are driving prices up and creating greater scarcity. What can we recommend? So put simply, Hawaii's housing crisis uh, is a supply problem that requires a supply-driven solution. Uh, Hawaii has the most restrictive housing regulations in the country. Uh, all of those discourage home building. So a pretty straightforward solution would be to reform our housing regulations like single family zoning to increase density. And we don't need to look far for inspiration. Uh, so for example, in 2016, uh, Auckland, New Zealand, for example, uh, reformed zoning in about 75% uh, percent of the city. Uh, now, uh, this was a unique policy change uh, because most of the research that looked into housing, uh, housing deregulation in the form of uh, eliminating single-family zoning has, have only looked at cities that uh, deregulate only certain parts uh, of the city. Uh, mostly uh, below half of the city. Uh, Auckland was a unique example because of the fact that Auckland uh, deregulated the vast majority uh, of, of of the metropolitan area. And what have we what have we seen in Auckland since since the policy change? Well, uh, we saw that the construction rate doubled as a result of the policy change, and in fact, it immediately reduced housing prices in the densest areas of the city. And Auckland is also a great example because people often say, you know, you can't compare Hawaii to the mainland. You know, you can't compare Hawaii to other places. Hawaii is unique, you know, Hawaii exists in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, but, you know, I hate to break it, you know, uh, to, to the naysayers, but Hawaii really isn't, isn't that special. You know, I like, I always hear this and I always like to repeat, the laws of supply and demand do not discriminate. The laws of supply and demand uh, apply whether or not you exist on the U.S. mainland, or, and they apply whether or not you exist in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And if the laws of supply and demand apply to us, 
then that means that the clearest solution for Hawaii's housing crisis is to build more homes. And I don't think that it gets any simpler than that. You know, uh, the irony is that when we argue for the building of more homes, even if the people we were talking to uh, agree to the solutions that we're proposing, sometimes we're told that more housing might just encourage more people to move to Hawaii and buy up all that housing. And so ultimately, we'll never be able to solve the problem of high-priced housing in Hawaii. Let me let you end on that note. What, what do you think about that kind of response? Yeah, so that's that's a popular, that's a very popular theory of, of Hawaii housing. And I, I like to call it the Malthusian theory of Hawaii's housing crisis, which refers to uh, Thomas Malthus's or, or Robert Malthus's theory of, of population growth, that if we allow too many babies, the, 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 the planet's resources are going to deplete. But what I'll say to that is that there's really no evidence, no good evidence of this idea that building more homes will increase demand and, and increase prices. And for example, we have countless examples, such as uh, in Auckland, like I just mentioned, more construction, lower prices. In New York, there's good research that finds new construction reduces rents in, in close proximity. There's good evidence out of San Francisco that new construction that results from natural disasters, for example, which provides a good natural experiment, reduces prices. There's good evidence out of Minneapolis that finds that new construction not only reduces rents, but it also reduces the chances of eviction for renters. The, the evidence is very clear. It's supply that's the issue, and supply has to be what guides the solution. Well, Jensen, thank you very much. I appreciate you being on the program today. And I appreciate your great work at the Grassroot Institute. Mahalo. Thank you. My guest today has been Jensen Ahakovi, a research associate at the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, where we believe that research-based solutions are the best kind of work that can be done in finding what to do, do about Hawaii's problems. We want to see you next time. I'm Kili'i Akina on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. Until then, aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.